got it. So let's see. Any, it's not yet. Okay, I think we're live. So um, good afternoon, Europe. Good morning, United States, or good lunchtime there and wherever else you are in the world. My name is Carsten Schradin. I, it's my pleasure to be the host of today's fine seminar. First, I would like to actually look back on um, last week when we had a very nice and, and fascinating presentation by Peter Biedermann on evolutionary feedbacks between insect sociality and microbial management in Ambrosia beetles. And this gives me the opportunity to um, talk once again about our fine homepage where you have different resources, among them fine teaching, and there you find teaching slides, and there you can download um, sets of slides from previous fine teachers that you might want to use in your teaching. And um, Peter Biedermann, he also um, contributed a set of slides which I put online um, today, which um, are, are very interesting. So if you want to talk in your teaching about the ambrosia beetles and sociality and how this is related to microbial management, you will find some very interesting information here but there's of course also many other slides from previous fine teachers that you might be interested to have a look at then um also looking forward to next week not to forget to talk about this we're again talking about um, um insects there by karen kapheim we will talk about causes and consequences of behavioral plasticity in bees but today we will hear from Marcus Zettel about the social life of African mole rats and I think it will be partly about whether or not these mole rats are really used social or not. So Marcus um, Zettel he is um, for us somebody which we say uh, one of the rising stars we like to invite to define he is um, having a position at the Linnaeus University in Sweden but it's a tenure track position and from all his research I thought and, and output we're pretty sure he will also get the permanent position there and continue his amazing work on the mole rats he's originally from Austria where he studied at the University of Vienna but then he came actually as a master student to Martha Manzer's group at the University of Zurich working with with meerkats on um, chemical communication, how they um, can react to chemical cues from predators. That's quite some time ago when I was there still myself in Zurich. At the moment, I'm now in Strasbourg. So it must be more than um, 10, 10 years ago. Then in 2009 until 2012, he was a PhD student in Michael Daborski's group. You might remember the fine talk Michael gave here about his ticklet fish and there um, he worked on Lamprologus pulcher on conflict and cooperation before going back to the meerkats, working to, not to the meerkats, but to the meerkat project, the Kalahari project to work together with Tim Klattenbrock on the Damaraland mole rats in the Kalahari region. So he didn't go to work with the meerkats, but on these Damaraland mole rats. And he was helping there to set up these research facilities they have on the mole rats, which I think we saw here also in the fine in the movie that Marta Manza showed about the Kalahari Research Center. So he, he worked um, with these, these mole rats that are said to be maybe um, use social, both in captivity, but also in the field from 2012 to 2017 as a postdoc. And then 2018, he got this tenure track position at the Linnaeus University in Sweden, where he is since ever then. And also just for information, because all these countries might have different funding opportunities, he himself had to apply for a research grant from the Swedish um, Science Academy to get um, this funding for this um, tenure track position with which he then approached this university that accepted him. And it's at the moment, uh, it seems to be going, going very well. And hopefully it, it will work out. He has more than um, 26 papers um, on, on his research, most of them so somehow in one of the journals of the Royal Society, but also other journals like PHG and PNAS. So his work has been um, widely um, broadcasted within our community. I think most people that all people that work on sociality at least in mammals, have read some of his papers. And I'm very much looking forward to your talk today, Marcus, about um, the, the social sociality in, I believe, the Damaraland mole rat and the naked mole rat. So thanks very much for the introduction. 
I will just share my screen so you can see my um, presentation here. Uh, thanks very much for the introduction, Carsten. Thanks very much for having me here in this uh, seminar series. I'm very excited and I have to admit a little bit nervous too about giving this presentation because so many of my scientific idols and heroes are here among the audience and I see some of them already here present in this Zoom meeting. And I know that many people are watching on Zoom too. So thanks very much for having me. I'll be talking about um, social evolution and the evolution of cooperative behavior in African Norets. But before I start talking about this topic, let me just introduce the people that I've been collaborating with over the last uh, years on this and various other subjects and that have contrib made large contributions to the uh, work that I'm presenting today. So this is Hannah Bench, who is my current um, PhD student in my group at Linnaeus University who is working on um, the Marland Mora. Jack Thorley, a collaborator that has been a PhD student postdoc in Tim Gladenbrook's group and is now in Liverpool. Yannick Francioli, who is a, or who has been a research assistant in my group. Kyle Finn is currently a PhD student in Nigel Bennett's lab in Pretoria and I'm co-supervising him. So a lot of the work has been, has involved him too. Shai Rotix, who, is, uh, who has been a postdoc in my group and is now back in Cambridge with Tim Plattenbrock, who's been working with me on both Naked and the Marland Morats. Susie Sigmund, who has done her uh, master project on uh, Naked Morats. Oscar Nordal, who is a postdoc on Naked Morats at the moment in my group. And um, obviously, collaborators who have um, and mentors who have worked with me for many, many years on these um, on these data that I'm presenting today. Tim Plattenbrock um, in Cambridge, Nigel Bennett, who has been a, a long-term mentor and collaborator on various more projects in Pretoria, and Stan Broad and uh, Hussein Riley, who are now collaborating with me on a new project on Naked Morats. So these are really the people that have helped um, to, to generate all the data and the um, research that you'll be seeing here. And my main research interest is the evolution of cooperative behavior. And when we talk about cooperative behavior, we usually mean two types of behaviors, either mutually beneficial behaviors, so behaviors that are beneficial in terms of lifetime reproductive success for the actor who performs the behavior and the recipient, the individual that, um, that this, this behavior is performed towards, and altruistic behavior. Altruistic behavior is behavior that is, uh, has a net cost of lifetime reproductive success for the actor and uh, uh, a benefit to the recipient. And those are the two types of cooperative behaviors. And when we look around animals, we see that mutualistic cooperation is very common. We find it and it's easy to explain why it should evolve. It benefits the recipient and the actor it's easy to explain how it evolves. It's found in, um, in group living animals that mob predators, group defense of social animals is a good example for it, but also hunting or some types of foraging where animals hunt together and every individual that contributes to that behavior benefits or allo grooming where individuals groom each other. It's much more uh, difficult to explain obviously altruistic behavior and the, the most extreme and the most uh, clear examples of altruistic behavior and altruistic cooperation are found among the eusocial insects. And they're among the obligatorily eusocial insects where casts of helpers are permanently sterile on focus on certain tasks in a group of animals that helps the queen that is a specialized reproducer to reproduce more. So these animals, um, these helpers, these casts have not um, well, do not reproduce at all and have lifetime sterility. So these are the, really the clearest examples. Similar examples as in the termites on the top are also found among ants and other social insects. But we also find um, these types of uh, cooperation, both mutually beneficial cooperation and sometimes altruistic cooperation among cooperatively breeding species. In cooperative breeders, we find that um, there are no lifetime sterile individuals. These groups often have very high reproductive skew. All individuals retain their the reprodu reproductive potential over their lifetime and helpers assist 
breeders with reproducing. Because everyone still is able to reproduce, often cooperative breeding groups are characterized by high competition within groups. And the typical situation is that in these cooperative breeders, there is no such specialization as we see in some of the um, your social insects where individuals specialize on tasks. But in cooperative breeders, usually every individual does all the tasks. When we look at cooperative breeders, we see that some of them are obligate, which means that the reproduction depends on the help of helpers. And in those species, the lack of helpers often leads to failure of reproduction. And pairs of individuals that do not have helpers have very low reproductive success. In facultative cooperative breeders, this is more of a, a conditional strategy and helpers are sometimes present, but not always. This can depend on the population structure and the demography or on the environmental conditions. And in these facultative breeders, helper, the, the effects of helpers on reproductive success can vary from being quite important and very beneficial to being very small or inconsistent. So naked morals are a bit of a special case and, um, and have been often uh, called a eusocial mammal. Uh, eusocial mammal. They are cooperative breeders and, and it's been suggested that they share some characteristics with eusocial insects. In, in, in mole rats, you, you really find the situation that these are singular cooperative breeders. So in, in the groups, although they can be very large, in the case of naked mole rats, sometimes 200 or 300 individuals, on average, often around 60 individuals. But in these groups, there is always only one breeding female that breeds and probably mostly only one male, that some, that, but sometimes um, other males may reproduce too. In the groups, the offspring that's born delays uh, dispersal, stays in the group for long times and shows a suit of cooperative behaviors. So when you look at this, uh, at the Mulrat group, you can see that what they are doing is that they, ex that they live in a subterranean burrow. They essentially don't come to the surface. They may open up a hole and throw out sand, but they never walk on the surface uh, unless they are dispersing. So they built these large underground burrow systems and there they have a, a very um, efficient foraging, a cooperative foraging system where all individuals contribute to extending this burrow system and that's the way how they find their main food source, which are um, tubers. Um, so they also have um, alloparental care in forms of that all individuals huddle together in a nest and keep the offspring warm. If offspring wanders out of the nest or there are times of danger, helpers or non-reproductive individuals may carry them back to the nest. But what, what, what um, distinguishes the, the type of alloparental care from many other cooperative breeders is that there is no active provisioning. For example, there is no allo, um, allo suckling. So the queen is the only one that provides um, milk to the, to the pub. And um, what has been suggested for these uh, mole rats, which is quite remarkable, is that there is a caste system of division of labor in these groups that there are frequent workers that invest heavily in, in cooperation, in digging these tunnels. Often they remain small, um, so they have smaller bodies. And it's been suggested that some of them may spend their entire life in philopatry. In contrast, there may also be um, a cast of infrequent workers. And it's been suggested that perhaps these infrequent workers may be specialized dispersers. So individuals that have um, adopted an alternative developmental trajectory where they focus on fast growth, get big, disperse early in life and establish a new colony elsewhere and to save energy potentially to invest little in cooperation. And this, that would contrast this alternative pathway that I've described earlier where Philopatric helpers are um, philopatric individuals are investing a lot in cooperative behavior at home. 
So although we know most about, or we, we mostly think about naked mole rats when we hear African mole rats, there are actually very many different species in six different genera of the African mole rats. And the, the, the naked mole rats are not the only social species. There are um, two other genera, Fucomis and Cryptomis mole rats. You see them here on the top. Um, here is the Fucomis and the Cryptomis mole rats. These are hairy mole rats, and they are copodif breeders too. And especially one species, the Damarland mole rat, that belongs to the genus, genus Fucomis, has been suggested to be eusocial too. So they and share some traits with um, eusocial insects. So also in these species, it's been suggested that helper casts of different sizes exist, where some help a lot, frequent workers, and others help little uh, and are infrequent workers. And it has been suggested that there are divergent developmental trajectories that lead to um, dispersing individuals that focus on gaining direct reproductive success and philopatric individuals that focus on helping and gaining indirect benefits. So these, the Marland morots, and most of my research has been on that species, they live here in the Kalahari Desert in central, um, in, central, uh, in, in central Botswana, but also uh, reaching with their distribution into Namibia and South Africa. And we study them here at the Kuruman River Research, at the research site where, um, where Tim, and, Tim Klappenbrock and Martin Manza also conduct their uh, Meerkat research. And other populations have been studied here in Dordobis and Tswalu. So when, when I started my postdoc with Tim Klappenbrock, he had the idea of finding a mammalian system where you can actually do experiments on a large number of groups and when you, where you can um, investigate how individual variation of cooperative behavior emerges and what the consequences are. So Tim has um, at that time received a grant to build up a large indoor laboratory facility at the Meerkat um, research site. And this is probably what you, what what Carsten or a similar setup that Carsten has already um, seen and shown, shown you here at Friday. This is um, how we can study them in captivity. We built artificial tunnel systems where mole rats can actually walk, run and work in their, in their tunnels. You can see here in the back, I hope you can see the arrow here. You can see here there are vertical tu uh, tubes that feed sand into these systems so that the mole rats need to work and need to um, uh, show like their cooperative behavior that they would also show in the wild in order to, uh, for us to be able to study individual variation in cooperative behavior. So one of the things that we, that we uh, first thought of, uh, of looking at was like how these, how, how these casts develop. And we had a, we had an, um, we had relative clear uh, predictions what types of behavior we would see and how these behaviors would be distributed if we expect there to be casts um, of, of individuals specializing on behaviors. So we, we would expect in such a caste system that there are divergence of phenotypes with some individuals contributing more and others contributing less to cooperative behavior. We would expect that these differ in body mass as suggested previously, and that the body mass therefore predicts the behavior and the investment in cooperative behavior. We would also expect um, that we'll see specialization on tasks and that this would potentially lead to be a multimodal distinct distribution, distribution of cooperative phenotypes and morphological phenotypes when we think about mass, body mass. And in contrast, what we see often among other cooperatively breeding ma um, mammals or birds is that age and status related changes are very important for cooperative behavior. We often see that helping behavior is condition dependent with um, individuals in better condition providing more help. And what we usually don't find is task specialization. So helpers or individuals in, in cooperatively breeding groups are mostly um, uh, generalists doing all tasks. 
What we saw in the, in, when we looked at the development of cooperative behavior, and here we look at the proportion of time that individuals spend um, excavating or doing other borrow maintenance tasks. What we saw there is that through individuals that are born in the group, when they, when they grow older, their investment in cooperative behavior increases until they are about one year of age. They start helping at the age of around 100 days and then it increases and plateaus a little bit later. What you can also see is that fast growing individuals help more initially in life. And potentially we see that helping later in life levels off. When we looked at how cooperative phenotypes are distributed through the population, we find that among all the age classes in the population that we look, there is a unimodal distribution that is very close to a normal distribution of these behavioral phenotypes. So we did not find any bimodal or distinct cooperative phenotypes. What we also saw is that individuals that invested more in one task also invested more in another task. In some tasks, this investment is uncorrelated, but what we would expect from specialized individuals is if they, that when they invest more in one task, they would invest less in another task. And we would expect that this would lead to a negative correlation uh, across individuals with, within individuals across tasks. But what we find largely is for all the tasks that we looked at, that they are either uncorrelated or positively correlated to each other and negative correlations are absent. When we looked at the growth development, we saw that, it, that mole rats really show a big variation in, um, in, in the maximum body mass that they attain. You see here, this graph is for males in our population. Um, and you see some individuals achieving not much more than a body mass of 80 to 100 gram and others at the same time, and when they level off in growth rate, having achieved uh, 200 uh, grams of body mass. So there is unusually high variation of growth, but also this variation is not bimodally distributed, but is um, largely described by a unimodal distribution of body masses across the population. So what we saw with, this, um, with these patterns was that the cognitive behavior uh, shows age-related changes, it, the, the, the amount of work they provide or the amount, of, yeah, the amount of work they perform changes with age. We don't see that the size differences of animals predict how they work. And we do not find uh, specialization on certain tasks. We also find continuous distributions throughout the, 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 um, the traits that we looked at. And all this is quite consistent with the, with the behavioral and cooperative patterns that we know from other cooperative breeders. Now, the Damarland mole rat is very similar to the naked mole rat, but there are also differences. The Marland mole rats are, for example, um, living in much smaller groups. In our study population, the group size is, the average group size is about eight to nine individuals. So compared to naked morals that live in groups of, uh, maybe the mean group size of 60 and up to 100, 200, or even 300 individuals, that's quite a difference. So obviously we were asking ourselves, well, perhaps we didn't find these patterns that we thought might be present in, in the Marland morals, but perhaps they are present in naked morals. So one of my students conducted a, a similar study or over a year in the Sioux of Vienna, um, and looking at, uh, also looking at animals in Nigel Bennett's lab in Pretoria, she studied in total 11 groups and conducted frequent behavioral observations. And we were here asking the question whether he, there's task specialization in naked morals. And for those tasks that we looked at, food carrying, nest building and borrowing in captive groups of naked morals, we didn't find any task specialization. And remember, task specialization would predict that we have a negative correlation um, uh, between uh, different tasks within individuals. We find either positive correlations or again, 
negative correlations. So this looked very similar to the data that we knew from the, from the Damarland morals. So it looked as if naked morals don't specialize on tasks too. And that may suggest that the division of labor might be similar to what we've seen in the Damarland morals. But obviously, um, the morads in captive systems have a very uh, have much smaller space, and they are being fed at libitum, so they do not uh, have to dig large burrows. And perhaps it's possible that we only find these um, quite complex patterns of cooperative behavior in wild morads where they are challenged to find food. And to do to investigate that, we start we we. We started at the same site where the laboratory is already during my postdoc in 2014. We started a field study on social morads in the wild environment with the aim of studying the behavior of wild morads. And by now, we have studied more than 40 wild groups and ha have data for seven years. So that's quite an extensive data set. But when you work with morads in the wild, you don't usually see them. What you do see and what you, how you find them are these type of mounds where the sand is pushed out from an opening um, and creates such yeah, sausages. So it's very characteristic and you can then start digging and that's what you have here. And if you're lucky, you find the, the tunnel of the morads in the ground. You can then place Hickman traps as we do here into those um, burrows. And if you're lucky, you capture a morad that looks like this here. And then you continue trapping in this hole until there, is no, there are no more animals coming and the bait in the trap is not touched anymore. And then you know you've captured the entire group if you wait long enough. So you capture one by one animal. And as soon as you have captured one, you remove them or keep them in the lab in a safe space until the entire group is captured. And like this, you can mark them permanently with a pit tag, release them, and recapture them, this, the same group after half a year and follow individuals through their life as they progress from being uh, a helper or a, a non-breeder in a group to after they've dispersed and become a breeder in another group. But we were really interested in their behavior, but as you can imagine, like the behavior of mole rats in the wild is really difficult to observe. Both of them, naked and the marland mole rats, live in these underground burrows and you need some Trick some like clever technical solutions to observe their behavior. And one of our first try, trials to do that was to work with their pig tags because we were working on, uh, on in individually identifying all animals and everyone was carrying a pig tag in the population. We could then install a pig tag reader on top of their uh, burrow where we knew because of mounds that they were foraging and put, expanding their burrow system and pushing sand out. And these pit tag readers then read the identity of the mole rats passing through this, um, the, through these tunnel systems and give us an idea which types of individuals are active at what time and how long in this foraging, in these foraging areas. And when we looked at that, we saw that non-breeders are about 50% more active than breeders in these kind of um, foraging areas. So what you can see, both breeders, uh, females in black and males in gray, and here both types of helpers, males and females, are less active. But we did not find a difference among helpers using this technique. And we were also not entirely happy because, again, we couldn't identify their behaviors. What we could identify was presence, time, and activity in a foraging area, but we did actually not know where they were digging or whether they were going there to eat. So we weren't entirely happy. And that's uh, when, when um, Shai Rotix joined uh, uh, Tim's, Tim Klappenbrock's group. And he is an expert on, uh, on studying animal behavior by using body acceleration. And that was obviously a, a, a really great idea and a, a great system to study the behavior of wild morads. Because what you could do is you could uh, attach a body acceleration logger that you can see here um, on a Damarland morad 
onto a collar, captured a group, captured a group, fit the body acceleration loggers on all animals in the group, released them into the ground, and recapture them after three weeks, for example. And, um, and then read out the data and by using the body acceleration pattern, uh, inferring um, the behavior that the animals have been engaged with. And we have now taken this further and also working with naked mole rats using the exactly same technique of body acceleration. What you need to do when you want to transfer the, the body acceleration patterns into true behaviors is that you have individuals carry such a um, body acceleration logger and you film them and you develop a supervised machine learning algorithm that identifies behaviors by using different signatures of body acceleration data. And you can see here that, for example, digging in naked mole rats produces a very different pattern from eating, resting, or sleeping, and even walking. So we are able, by using this machine learning classifier, we quite high accuracy uh, to identify broad behavioral classes from animals on the ground. And by releasing and capturing them, we can, uh, we can get an insight into which behavior, or which animals are investing how much in which behaviors. And we did that for um, the Damarland mole rats. And again, we were interested whether there are any indications that there might be special that there might be specialization or um, like B-modal distributions of behavioral phenotypes. And we, when we looked at the wild data of from this uh, at the data from wild mole rats on this you know, generated through these acceleration loggers, we did find again that the proportion of of work working phenotypes was unimodally distributed. So there weren't distinct classes of frequent workers or infrequent workers in our population in, in the Kalahari. When we looked again at the correlations of different um, helping activities, we either find um, positive correlations, relatively weak positive correlations, for example, between here between food carry and excavating activities, or no correlations at all. So again, negative correlations are absent and we are not finding um, any evidence for uh, specialization on specific tasks in, in the wild morals. And this really gave us a chance to look at, um, to, to, or to reassess some of these um, uh, suggestions that were made for morals. For example, that there are specialized, specialized dispersers. Because now we had actually the opportunity to study moral behavior and to relate it to life history decisions. So, um, for example, what we would have, uh, and remember these specialized dispersers are fast growing individuals that disperse early in life and invest little in cooperation, whereas others, um, not, more specialized philopatric individuals, we would expect them to grow, or we would suggest they grow slow, disperse later or remain for a very long time and invest more in cooperation. So we can make very clear predictions how we would think that cooperative behavior should be distributed in those groups if, um, if this was the case. We would expect that faster growth is associated to less cooperative behavior. We would also expect that faster growth is associated to shorter time in philopatry because they're dispersing. And we would, uh, if these were specialized dispersers, we would probably also expect that these fast growing specialized dispersers are more successful in dispersing. So uh, when we looked at how growth is related to the proportion of excavating activities in our long-term study population in the, in the Kalahari, we saw that again, the same pattern emerged that we found in the laboratory, that faster growing individuals do actually invest more in excavating activities and in cooperative borrowing. And we found no, in a, in a different study, we found no association between the growth rates and the tenure of philopatry. So individuals were dispersing at the same time, regardless of if, regardless of whether they have shown a very fast growth at home or a slow growth rate. 
What we also found is that dispersers, so individuals that later show up as successful dispersers and, and, um, and generate or manage to create a new group elsewhere, that these were the individuals that we have seen earlier in their home group growing faster. So that means that fast growth in these males may not represent adaptive divergence in male dis development for either early dispersal or extended phylopetry, because we don't see a different, uh, different, um, a different time that they spend phylopetry. But instead, it might just be that um, instead of being specialized dispersers, these fast growing individuals are high quality individuals that are growing fast in their home group, invest a lot in cooperation, and are subsequently, when they have dispersed the successful founders of new groups. So it might just be that there is a quality difference that generates this pattern rather than a specialization on different alternative trajectories that lead to, um, that lead to extended phylopatry or early dispersal. What we also saw in this wild Tamarla and Morats is that, um, and you can see here uh, how individuals invest in cooperative behavior and cooperative borrowing independence of different group sizes. What we did see is that generally there, there might be uh, a, a trend where for non-reproductive individuals here in blue, the group size effect is not very strong. So we don't find a strong reduction in workload in larger groups for helpers. But in red for the breeders, we do see actually that the breeders in large groups um, work less hard than breeders in small groups do. So that raises obviously the questions, what are the benefits of uh, living in large groups? And do the Marlin Moritz rely on the help for excavating from their helpers so that they should be considered obligate cooperative breeders? And, and it raises the question, how survival, reproduction and development is dependent on the assistance from non-breeders? So fortunately, by the time uh, we already had quite a lot of data on life history growth and survival and reproduction of individuals in our study population in the wild. So you can see a little bit how this uh, population looks like here. Each group on this graph is one row. You can see the bubble are the events when we captured the groups and the size of the bubbles represents the group size. So for example, in 2014, we started to, we captured a very large group here um, that has probably 25 or more individuals that remained relatively large until yeah, 2016, 17, and then got smaller and got extinct later. In contrast, you, you see that we also had here an, uh, a group where a single individual was captured in 2014 until uh, it paired up with another individual in 2017. So this individual spent three years alone. And then uh, they reproduced and founded a relatively large group that persisted until the end of this sampling period. So you can see a little bit what's the size of the population from this graph and how groups grow and go extinct. What we also noticed when we worked in our uh, population is that very many individuals were single females. You can see here a, a histogram of the group sizes in our population that we captured over the time. And actually the, the modal value is one. So it's the most common group size that we find. The average group uh, size is about uh, nine individuals, as I've told you. If you not count the single individuals, if we would count the single individuals, the group size is around six individuals. But nine can be taken as a good representative representation of a of a breeding group uh, mean size. So they were very common, and this puzzled us all because we obviously expected these to be um, groups that are dependent on on cooperative foraging uh, and living in a group. And then we find so many uh, single individuals. 
And the interesting thing, thing was that I already pointed out a little bit earlier on the slide that some of these single individuals, they survived for a very long time. So for example, you can see here is a single female, KR21 female one, that it survived um, for a substantially uh, long time and is still single in the end of capturing them in 2020. So this individual is has been a single for about five years and is now more than seven years old. So uh, single individuals can survive very long. And when we compare the survival of single individuals to other types of individuals in the population, we actually find that the survival of single individuals is statistically no different from breeders. And here you can see the annual probability of disappearing, which means that um, a, a higher uh, value indicates that these individuals are disappearing at a higher rate from the population. So they are, although it's a bit higher for single individuals than for breeders, there's statistically speaking no significant difference and non-breeders disappear at a higher rate. And when we then looked at the body condition of these animals to find out whether they have difficulty with foraging and finding food, we saw that actually the body condition here expressed in a regression between body length and body mass is no different from all other group living individuals in the population. Um, so there is really no difference, uh, no indication that they have trouble finding food or surviving. So what we then did is we wanted to, to test on whether they need help us to reproduce. And what we did is we found single females and paired them up with the male by removing a non-breeding male from another group, pairing it up with the female and releasing it in their single borrow. And when we then measured the reproductive success of these newly experimentally created pairs, we find that there is actually no difference to established breeding groups in a time matched uh, time frame, And there's also no, dif uh, no uh, difference to an overall reproductive success within the population. So it, it appears that the marlin mole rats are perfectly fine and able to reproduce. When we look through the population um, and we, call, we analyze how recruitment rate is related to group size, we find that larger groups do reproduce uh, or have a higher recruitment rate in the population. But what, what is also the case is that there's a lot of variation around this, um, uh, around this uh, trend and that there are uh, many relatively small groups that have also relative high reproductive success. So essentially, um, I, yeah, so essentially there is a positive relationship, but not a particularly strong one. And what we also found is that there is no effect of group size on adult survival in our population. And when we looked at the development and growth rates of individuals, we found that pups born in large groups, in green here, initially grow faster until 200 days, 250 days of age or 300 days of age, and then their growth rate declines. So that, as, that although in the beginning, pups of small groups grow slower, they in the end reach a higher asymptotic mass, which may suggest that there is also some cost attached to living in large groups because potentially of competition between um, individuals in the group. So really what we see is that the Marlin mole rats um, show no specialization. In our population, we don't find evidence for casts, and we also don't find evidence for divergent developmental trajectories that lead to either extended philopatry or independent breeding. So overall, their behavior resembles that of other cooperative breeding mammals, and because they can reproduce very well in pairs, they are not obligate cooperative breeders. It is also likely that um, non-breeders do confer some sort of costs and benefits to the breeding pairs. And what we really don't understand now is how, how, this, is um, how this is related to altruistic cooperation. And we don't know, really know whether there are costs of helping. And we have a relatively poor understanding for costs and benefits of helping in these moderate groups. 
And as I've told you, uh, we have all we've we found also no specialization in naked mole rats. But what we really thought is that there we we again need to go out into the wild and collect behavioral data in a similar manner as we've done on the on the Damarland mole rats. And that's what we are doing in a project that I've that we started last year here in Djibouti, where we work in a valley that you can see here on this picture. The mole rats live in these sandy banks of the river, of the dry riverbed. And we have a study going on there where we put collars on naked mole rats and try to, uh, to measure their cooperative behavior and their growth patterns to test similar predictions that I've just shown you for naked mole rats. So just to to come back in the very end of my talk uh, um, to the to to the African mole rats, one thing that I that I always found a bit uh, sad is that although there are like fifteen different Fukumi species all over Africa, and there are several subspecies or or species of Cryptomys mole rats, really what the most of what we know about the behavior of these mole rats comes from a relatively limited number of species. And there is a lot of potential in, in studying mole rats um, comparatively. But that's a relatively difficult task too. And in one of our studies, we have now recently tried to address this problem by looking at capture order. You know, remember, as I told you, in, we are capturing the mole rats one by one, and we know which one was the first one to be captured and which one was the last one, and we have an order. And the capture order may be related to the investment in borrowing because we capture them in foraging areas. And those individuals that are more present in these foraging areas are captured earlier. And what we find in naked mole rats is that the breeders, both male breeders and female breeders, are very late captured in the capture order, sometimes even as last animals. And when we look at that in the marland mole rats, we find, too, a significant effect of breeders being captured later. But this is about 10 times smaller in effect size than we, what we find in naked mole rats. And when we look at other cryptomys mole rats and other subspecies here, the natal mole rat and the mahali mole rat, we find a very similar pattern, but in those species only for, uh, for the breeding females that are captured later than others. So what this suggests to me is that there are broad similarities in social organization between different social species with breeding females potentially having different roles in, 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 the, in, the, in, the, um, in the society of the mole rats, but that the effect sizes vary dramatically between species. And it's possible that naked mole rats are much more extreme in many of the traits um, that we are interested in than other mole rats. So with that, I want to thank you all for listening. Um, I want to acknowledge these people for all their help in the studies uh, that we have conducted and that we have been that I've presented here today. And I'm looking very much forward to taking your questions. Thank you very much for fascinating talk. I'm sure there will be lots of questions. I have, I would have lots of questions. Um, like always, and we do it like this. When you have a question, please type a question mark. I think it just, did I not just post this? Type a question mark into the chat. And then I call up on you. And when it's your turn, please quickly introduce yourself. We might know many of you by now, but there's always new people in the audience say, what's your name, which institution you are, and what, what you're doing very quickly before asking a question. It also prepares us to understand um, the way you're talking, because we all have different accents. You hear it from me. Um, the way I talk might be difficult for some people um, to understand. And to the people on YouTube, I will have a, a, an eye on the chat in YouTube. And when you have questions there, I will also transfer it here to the Zoom meeting at a later stage. OK, so tonight or today, we start with Ute Radespiel, please. Yeah, hello. Thanks very much uh, for the nice presentation. I'm Ute Radespiel from the Institute of Zoology at the Veterinary, the University of Veterinary Medicine in Hanover. And um, I would be interested to know, you mentioned um, at some occasion that the groups may get extinct or survival is related to so and so, but I did not really get uh, the point, what is limiting survival in particular? Is, is there predation going on? Are they 
getting extinct when their resources are depleted or what is the reason um, how this happens and what is limiting survival or how, how do they get extinct, these groups? Yeah, very good question. So what we see, generally these boroughs are permanently sealed. You have seen that naked morals, they have open boroughs, but the Damarland morals actually, they have permanently sealed boroughs. So we think that predation is actually very low. And that's also probably the reason why individuals, although being a small rodent of mole rats can live so long. So um, essentially they, they rarely go extinct or we think they rarely go extinct because of, of heavy predation. But what happens at some point, the, the breeding female dies or the breeding male dies. And then um, reproduction often slowly ceases, uh, slowly ceases. So there's no more reproduction in the group. And uh, over a longer period, the groups then, uh, the individuals then disperse and the group fragments and the group stops to exist. But that takes quite a while because these models can stick around for some time before they really um, disperse. They then disperse in, uh, mostly, mostly as single individuals and found other groups. The reason why reproduction isn't um, like, yeah, isn't passed over to another female is probably because at least in Damarland Moritz, they are outbreeders. So they don't, and because most of the groups start with a pair, they are actually all related to each other except for the two breeders, which probably helps to maintain reproductive skew too. So really what we see is then um, that these groups, because there is no more breeding in these groups, they fragment, disperse, and the individuals try to create new groups elsewhere. There's very, very rarely uh, we see matrilines or um, inheritance of, of, of breeding in the groups. But you were talking of recruitment, right? So there may be some potential uh, newcomers uh, that, that could take over if it is for outbreeding. So what I meant with recruitment is production of young in the group. So I didn't mean that re recruitment is immigration. For me, I used recruitment in a way of, of describing their reproduction in the group and perhaps being born in the group, being recruited into the group. Okay, thanks. Okay, then the next question will be from Phoebe Edwards and afterwards Sarah Hardy has questions. She sent it to me directly. The others can't see. That's why I'm just saying it at once. So you prefer So first Phoebe and then Sarah. Hi, um, I'm Phoebe Edwards. I'm a postdoc in Melissa Holmes group at University of Toronto. Um, and we are working with Nick and Moratz as well. Um, and I know some previous work from the group has shown a bimodal distribution in colony defense behavior, where some individuals are much more aggressive to novel conspecifics uh, than others are. So I was wondering if you've ever observed these kind of differences in aggression in the Damarlins or in the field, or if it's just like too rare to document in the field. Uh, really, really interesting, uh, really interesting data um, and very, very good question. So we have not we have not measured defense behavior in the Damarland Morals. In the field, it's very, very difficult. Um, and I, I wouldn't really know how I would go about doing it. In the laboratory, we could do it. And I think that is really something that that, that would be great to do. Because as you say, you might you might find um, these kind of patterns um, that we did not find in in those behaviors and those cooperative behaviors that we uh, looked at in other behaviors. That's absolutely possible. Okay, thank you. And very interesting talk. Thank you. Thank you. Then next question, um, if you want to ask them, Sarah Hardy. Oh, yeah. Thank you, Marcus. That was fascinating and ingenious methodologies. Um, I'm not clear on the recruitment, how it works. Is there's, there's never individuals from the former colony following the disperser? Yeah, dispersal is mostly alone. In our population, we find that most dispersers, they leave the group um, at some point. And there are essentially two possibilities for a mole to disperse. You can either tunnel, borrow away and backfill the tunnel to the group, so separating <laughs> yourself from the group. Uh -huh. Or you can walk on the surface, go elsewhere and try to dig down and create a new borrow. 
And what we find is that, um, that uh, the individuals do that, uh, probably both, uh, but that it is common for them to disperse above ground. And because they are blind, I think that they, they leave, they borrow at night, they walk around and try to borrow elsewhere down. And it is actually nearly impossible for mole rats to coordinate, to disperse like this in groups because they don't see anything. They're blindly walking on the surface. When they do borrow away, I think if they would coordinate, then they could disperse in small subgroups. But this is very rare. So is it mostly females who are moving because then they can breed there or are there gravid females moving? How do they make a colony after they get there? Yeah, really um, um, interesting, good question again. So what we see is that they, that when they, that there is differences between the sexes in dispersal behaviors. The females create a new borrow elsewhere alone, but they haven't made it because they only met their brothers and their father in their group. Mm -hmm. So then they sit without having made it and without having anyone else in their borrow and wait until an unrelated male joins them in their borrow. And that's, that's a period that can take so long. And that's why we find single females sitting sometimes for a year, for two years, for three years even, and waiting for a male to find them. And the males probably, because we, I mean, it's, this is now inference because we don't find them sitting in single boroughs. We think that males probably go above ground, try to locate those single females. Okay, join okay. The groups. okay, yeah. What we also see among, among males sometimes that they can enter established groups. So it's not, always the case that there are no unrelated group, unrelated males in the groups, but very often. Thank you. Yeah, interesting questions. The next question comes from Eduardo. Thank you, Marcus. I'll second what the others have said. Fascinating talk. I have so many questions. I am trying, I'm trying to figure out which one I ask now. And I think it's going to be one uh, aiming a little bit more at the methodology. Can, can if you could Repeat, I know you said it, but I want to understand how you're thinking empirically in terms of, of, of your methods and your data collection of specialization. It, because of your ingenious methods, as, as Sarah was saying, that you can use now accelerometry, it, if, if I follow you well, you're not considering the temporality of the behavior of the different animals as a possible proxy for thinking of specialization, right? I mean, the, the, the unit of time over which you compare what animals are doing, uh, now with, with, with the technologies you're using would allow you to really look at how the animals are coordinating when each one does what. Mm -hmm. And I wonder if there could be an angle to thinking of specialization in terms of the temporality of your behaviors. But maybe maybe you you spoke to the to this and I missed it. No, that's a that's a that's a brilliant question, and we we've been thinking a lot about this. So when we worked on the data in the laboratory, we were trying different things. We looked at specialization over a very long time, and didn't find it. And then we were narrowing it down to smaller time frames too, and didn't find it. Um, for the data that we collected in the wild on the Lamarin mole rats, uh, so the 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 batteries of this acceleration loggers, they last for three weeks. So in terms of the, of the life of a mole that's not very long. That's more or less a snapshot. And I mean, if you go down, so, uh, so and what we did is we, we either treat, we can either treat the three weeks as one data point, or we could, for example, do it on a daily basis. And look at uh, look at it in a daily on a daily basis and see whether on a daily basis there is specialization and then control for non independence obviously statistically and things like that and we did both of that and we did we we did not find any differences in in doing it either on a daily basis or on the three weeks but what we cannot do is with the acceleration there we are limited by the battery lifetime and by the methodologies go over longer periods at least um, until now we can't. Potentially, that's, that will that will get better with um, larger batteries and better batteries and some things like that. Thank you. 
Okay, then the next question comes by Michael Taborski. Michael Taborski, University of Bern. Uh, thanks very much, Markus. Uh, very interesting data, really uh, great insights from uh, applying these uh, elegant methods. Uh, my question concerns uh, the costs of helping. You said that you don't have any information on the cost of helping, but of course, um, you can only help if you are philopatric, if you stay at home. So there is a trade-off between staying at home or dispersing. And of course, if you look at inclusive fitness, that doesn't make much difference because you have uh, apparently full siblings that you care for at home. But still, at some stage, uh, you need to disperse uh, to spread uh, to spread your your genes, so to speak. Um, so I think you you might have data actually on how long it uh, holds you up to disperse and start reproducing independently. Of course, the problem is they're long lived, and and apparently also. Uh, have difficulties of finding mates because you find these single individuals for very long times. So it may not be easy to, to really um, quantify the relative time costs of staying at home. But perhaps you have some idea from your, from your impressive data set already. Uh, yeah, I think it's very difficult to, to, um, to think in, yeah, to try of thinking of a way how to measure the costs of, of helping. What we do, I mean, what we do, we have a, a little bit of an idea, and that is, I think the best data we have on it is that, that the amount of cooperative borrowing, which is very expensive in terms of energy investment, is related to the way, to the way individuals grow. So fast growing individuals, they also invest more time borrowing. And, uh, and I think that is interesting. That is, to me, this is one of the most interesting findings of all our, of all our data. And I think it's, it has a, a big significance to it because it, uh, it suggests that you help as much as you, as you can afford without jeopardizing your own future direct fitness probably. And those individuals that, that already struggle with energetics and maybe are, are dominated by other helpers and, and are growing slowly, they also don't help as much in excavating the borrow system. But wouldn't that uh, positive correlation between borrowing and growth rate suggest that this is rather a selfish behavior, that they borrow a lot to find tubers or something, and it's not so much helping really? Should be, absolutely. Um, I agree. Um, that could be an interpretation of it. and. Um, the, 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 the one thing is that, that we think that most of their food items are so big that they cannot monopolize it. So those individuals that do find them, of course, they, they do it, they, they potentially do it out of purely selfish interests, but they might still generate mutualistic um, uh, benefits to other individuals in the group because they found such a big food item that then is either stored in the food store that other people have access to, other morads have access to, or it stays in place and other morads go there and eat. So, um, but I agree. Uh, you can explain this investment in, in what we call cooperative borrowing purely by selfish, um, with, with selfish um, benefits. Thank you. Thank you. I'm having uh, some problems with my internet connection here. If that is pursuing, maybe someone of the other co-hosts can continue. I don't know whether you see any problem of me. And but before we come to uh, Maren's question, I would like to encourage our young colleagues here, the PhD students and postdocs to please also contribute to the discussion because your questions are most often um, the most interesting ones, at least for me. So please um, don't be shy to ask questions. I will be born from a student in um, in um, Colombia soon from, from YouTube, but now first um, it's Maren's time. My name is Maren Hock, I'm at the University of Derby. Um, I would like to come back to the question by, um, or questions by Ute and Sarah, Sarah about the dispersal. So it sounds incredible that they find each other after dispersal at all. So do you have any ideas what kind of cues the males could use to locate a female? So smell, or could it be vibrations or, or 
what what do they do to find each other? Uh, uh, so what they do is because they when they borrow they get a lot of excess sand and they have to get rid of that because they want to have a borrow. So they push it out through these holes and you see these mounds coming out of the ground. So they, they walk until they hit a, hit a, a, a hill. No, what, I, what, I, what, I, what I'm um, trying to get at is that because they push out sand, there might be um, an odor cue in the sand that they push out of their, of their burrow. Mm -hmm. So that individuals that walk on the surface can um, smell uh, can smell that there is potentially a small group, that there is a, maybe a large group, or that there is a single female in this borough. So I and and we know from recent experiments in Tim's group that they can distinguish all sorts of information from from odor cues uh, in the sand. So it's it it it's possible that that this also helps males to locate these females. But it's also possible that they just blindly borrow into each other. Whether they use vibration, I haven't really observed any. So they are not doing the seismic communication that Spalaks, for example, do where they bang on the on the walls. And where they, these are sol solitary subterranean rodents that do this seismic communication. So for them, it's even more important to find each other because they just meet, mate, and then they borrow in di different directions again. But in our mole rats, um, yeah, they only need to, to find a mate once in their life, probably, and then they are fine. And, and that can take a while because it's difficult. But I think that the most likely cue that is used would be like some, some sort of odor cues on the surface. Then I bring a question from YouTube from Manuela Cardona. Hi, my name is Manuela Cardona. I'm a biology student of the Rosario University in Colombia. First of all, such a wonderful talk. My question is, is the labor selection of individuals given by other individuals in the group or is it given by physiological selection according to the growth rate of each offspring? Can you, can you read it once more, Carsten, please? Is the labor selection of individuals given by other individuals in the group or is it given by physiological selection according to the growth rate of each offspring? So she wants, I think she wants to know um, what, what the individual is helping. Is it determined by what others do or is it come, can, does it come from the inside from the physiological condition of the individual itself? So we think that there is quite a bit of effect for, of, their, of their own physiological state that affects that. And it's also possible that there are some sort of coordination in terms of work going on, um, but we don't, really, we don't really know to what extent there are social cues that either trigger working or trigger non-working. So this, is a, is, this would be a great topic to work on um, and, uh, and would, uh, it would be probably possible to do some clever experiments in the laboratory on coordination of work um, and work effort in, in these models. Okay, thank you. Then I myself have a question like Eduardo, I have to focus on one. First of all, thank you for really this fascinating talk and showing us that these two species of eusocial mole rats are in fact probably much closer to cooperatively breeding other mammals like meerkats than to termites and leafcutter ants where we have these um, highly specialized casts of different workers and, and soldiers and so on. But um, you showed in some of the graphs that the helping behavior of these morals might be more related um, to differences in age. And this reminded me of that in, in another new social insect, the honeybee, the different task they're having is also quite um, very much related um, to age. So do you think these morals might be to some degree more similar to what we find in, in honeybees and what we find in termites or leafcutter ants? Mm -hmm. So well, the way I understand um, this, this age-related variation in honeybees is that individuals have temporary specialization on different tasks in different stages of their life. And when we look at the mole rats, we see that the, the amount they work varies in different stages of their life. But at any given stage, if they do more of one behavior, they also do more of another behavior. So the, the, the age-related variation that we see is different in nature from this, um, from this temporary specialization in, in honeybees in the sense that they, that they vary in magnitude of work 
but not in the specifically of the tasks, at least to in those ta in those tasks that we study, uh, that we studied and that we that we analyzed here. Okay, very good point. Thank you. Then we have another question by Eduardo. And please, students, put some question marks in, otherwise you have to hear more questions from me. Uh, yes, you, if I'm following, I'm just fascinated by the natural history. I want to learn more about it. So do, have you had evidence a female disperses, digs herself in, sits and wait? So the first question is, do our males also doing that, or is it only females who are waiting for males? Males are not waiting for females. And second, have you found any evidence of some of those single males or females, instead of just sitting and crossing their fingers, challenging and trying to get into one of those active barrows with reproducing adults? Uh, so the, the first uh, part of the question, um, uh, help me again. Can you repeat the first part okay. of the question? So, so if I understood well, you're describing how a female may just dig herself in and wait to see if she's lucky and a male shows up. But are, do you see this, the same where males just dig so themselves we in we, and wait? We hardly ever capture single males. So in total, we've got about, I think, 46 single females in the, in the population. And I think we had three single males ever captured in a borough. So this is how we infer that this is not happening among males, because if they would be doing it, we should be finding them, at least at the same rate that we find females. What we do see is that males more, uh, are more likely to challenge other groups than females. We see they are more likely to, uh, to, to go into existing groups, potentially challenge males in the groups to take over breeding in there. Females, we have never seen a female doing that in our study population that she immigrates into an, existent, in, in, into an existing group. So, um, and I think that could be, that could, I mean, this, is, this makes sense to me. You have this single population, single females in the population, males leave their home borough, leave their home group, decide they are looking for an opportunity to reproduce. They are walking around relatively blindly on the surface. They have a very bad vision. They may find, in the best case, they find a single female. But if they don't find a single female, potentially their second best option is to try to challenge a group, to challenge the males in an existing group. And I, I assume that very often they'll fail and they probably kill the intruder. But sometimes we see that they, that they, do, um, that they do manage to immigrate into these groups. And during those times of immigration, because we only get snapshots before and afterwards, very often very many males that were in that group disappear in the same time frame. Thank you. Then the next question comes from Clara. Hello, um, very interesting talk. I have a really primitive question. Do you think that dispersal might be density dependent or frequency dependent? Dependent on the density and frequency of what, of groups of the, or of the population? In other words, depend on the frequency of the phenotype in the group or dependent on density of individuals in a group or population? Let me just try to, to remember that because I think um, Kyle Finn, uh, 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 a student in Nigel Bennett's group was recently doing this kind of analysis. And I wonder if I still remember what, what the results were. Um, so, what, uh, so what we do see is that in larger groups, apparently animals disperse further away from larger groups. So if they come from a larger group, they tend to have a larger dis dis dispersal distance potentially to get more space between them and this large group. Um, uh, but I think we do not find any relationship um, that you were um, asking after in terms of the 
the frequency or the probability of this person. Okay, thanks. Uh, can I ask a question? Absolutely, please go ahead. Yes, thank you. Uh, Tomislav Ladic, Stockholm. Uh, I guess my question is uh, kind of a semantic, but in your talk, you, you mentioned uh, a term, quality. Mm -hmm. Quality of males that uh, are different than other, because uh, as far as I understood, there is no difference in any of the, of the factors you measured. And then when you mentioned the quality, I just wondered because uh, during my PhD, which was uh, some time ago, uh, Michael, under, Michael remembers, I think. Uh, I mean, the, 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 the term quality was quite, uh, unaccepted and now almost everybody is talking about quality how do you use the term quality in your uh investigation thank you yeah i think the way thinking now about it I, I should have probably been um a bit a bit more explicit of what i was what i was saying but i think what i'm what i what i the point i'm i was trying to make is that that you can either have like you have variation in, in quality of individuals that's essentially um, fitness. A high quality individual is, a, is, a, is an individual with a high quality, uh, with, with a high fitness over, over their life. And if you have these two strategies that might be um, two alternative strategies, you might have individuals pursuing different, of, different developmental trajectories, but having like the same quality of the, high, the self fitness payoff in the end. Yeah. But that was not what we were finding, but rather that individuals do that, that, yeah, that some individuals manage to outperform other individuals on both of those components and they were not traded off against each other. And that's what, what I was alluding to. Why, why I ask you that question is because actually that is a philosophically interesting question because, you know, uh, uh, from the beginning, uh, working with quantities, and the, the 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 term of quality was quite unused until I don't know nineties uh, nineties, and now when uh, somebody uses quality, you know, it is kind of a kind of accepted, but uh, before it was not qu quite accepted. So I think uh, what we need to do within uh, ethology uh, is to define the terms we use quite uh, precisely. But thank you for a very interesting talk. Thank you. Yeah, I mean, today, when my lectures, I told students, it's always important we define what we're talking about so to know what the other one um, means. And um, now we come to a question from Adriana. Thank you, Carson. And thank you, Marcus, for such a nice talk. Um, I'm Adriana Maldonado, professor at Universidad del Rosario in Colombia. And my question is related to the dynamics of groups. You mentioned in your talk that group sizes vary from one to 25 individuals, if I remember correctly. And so I have three questions regarding that. The first one is how did you define groups um, in your system? Um, and the second one is how related are individuals within a group? Because you mentioned at some point that everyone was a brother, a sister, or somehow related. So I'm assuming, or I'm kind of, thinking what would happen in a group of 20, 25 individuals if everyone is related? Shouldn't that um, put a pressure on dispersal somehow? Um, and related to that, have you seen larger groups breaking apart at some point? Um, yeah, yeah, good questions. Um, so 
breaking apart so that groups split in two like relatively large portions of a group, ha we haven't seen that. Um, could potentially happen, but um, it's, a, it's not a very common pattern in any case. Um, what was the first, the first part of the question? How do you define a group? So a group uh, in our, in the Mulrat system, that's really easy to, to, to define what is a group. These are individuals that live together in the same borrow system. For us, that is when we trap them, we, catch, we put these traps in the ground in this borrow and we trap one by one individual and they come and we remove them and we put them into, into a safe space elsewhere. And at some point, there's no one coming anymore. And then we usually wait 24 hours and then we can be sure there's no more more in death coral. And this is what we define as the group. So I've been working before during my PhD on, on cichlids and they live in, they also have groups, but these groups are very close together and they visit each other all the time. And it's very difficult in that systems to, to really define who belongs to which group. But in the Morat system, that is one of the easy things. So we can be pretty sure that we, that we do get that right. There was another an, another th thing in your question that I didn't address yet. Yeah, so the relatedness along the group size variation. Yeah, so Nigel Bennett did some, uh, some uh, very good work on relatedness within groups in a different population. And they found that they are mostly related to each other. And every now and then, sometimes you find unrelated individuals in the groups. And that fits quite well with what we see from immigration and migration pattern in our groups. Because most of the groups come from pair, from singles to pairs, all the offspring will be related. Um, sometimes we see male immigrants, then the, the relatedness might be a bit different and might be a bit more uh, complicated or lower, but it's, it's not terribly common. So most of these individuals will be, um, will be related. And when the groups get very large, so the largest group, I think, in our population got close to 30 individuals at some time. Um, others have captured groups of up to 40 individuals. And obviously those groups will be quite crowded and uh, will be, but they also have then very big tunnel systems. We can at least assume so, we, we don't really know, but we can assume that they have big tunnel systems. And what we do see is that individuals leave uh, the groups quite regularly. But that's more like a steady, steady pattern of attrition, where every time you come and trap again, the biggest subordinates, the biggest non-breeders will probably have disappeared and have the highest probability of having dis disappeared. And the smaller ones will be a bit bigger. And then you have some new offspring on the bottom and the queue. And then again, next time you come, the biggest ones will have disappeared again. And then there are new offspring. So it's, um, yeah, it's, it seems to, to not be like mass immigration and group collapse or group splits, but rather like a permanent pattern of attrition. And then, because we know that this, their dispersal is quite heavily constrained by, um, uh, it's heavily constrained by environmental conditions. And when it's not raining and it's very dry, the soil is hard and the sand is dry, it's very difficult to dig and to, uh, to make these burrows. We also see that most of the individuals or individuals have a higher probability of dispersing after the rain than in the dry periods. So in the desert where rain can be quite stochastic and where, where quite long droughts can be relatively common, you then often find groups getting bigger and bigger during that time because individuals can't leave or don't choose not to leave under those conditions. And then when the rain comes, individuals disappear again. That's very interesting. Thank you very much. So, Marcus, you mentioned the importance of outbreeding in the Samaraland bull rats. Mm -hmm. There's only the breeding pair that's not related, also reducing reproductive competition because for the other females, there's nobody to breed. But now you mentioned rare cases of an immigrant male going into a group. Wouldn't that predict that in these cases, you there will be high reproductive competition induced between the females and conflict and maybe also triggering dispersal of females because they, they, they have to leave? Yeah, yeah, exactly. That's what we, that's what we, what we would expect, and I think that's exactly that's quite likely to happen, because these cases are quite rare of immigrating males. It's difficult to quantitatively analyze what happens to the females after that, and we cannot in the we, we cannot interact, uh, we cannot uh, record their 
aggressive interactions because the loggers and the machine learning isn't good enough to, to identify these kind of, whether there's an aggressive interaction or a non-aggressive interaction between the animals. We are working with broad categories there. So it's very difficult to study the aggression in wild models. But what we've seen in the laboratory um, is that, that there are times where they all start fighting. Often that was related to the death of the, of the dominant females and then sisters start evicting each other until there's only one female left and that female um, then becomes the new breeder. Uh, and I, I could imagine that that's likely to happen in the wild too. That once you have an immigrant male, that the females, unless they are very small, they would start fighting and the most strongest competitor among the females will be the new queen in that group and the others will be forced to leave. To leave. Yes, that makes a lot of sense. Then we have a question by David Woods. Wood, David Wood, sorry. Hi, thanks for a very interesting talk. My name is David Wood. I'm a third year PhD student at Yale working with Eduardo Fernandez Duque. Um, I'm wondering if, if you've ever seen, with all this really cool long-term data that you have, if a group has ever outlived one of the, the reproducing males or females and whether that results in um, inbreeding or just a mass exodus of all of the other group members. Yeah, what we usually find then is that, that individuals um, leave slowly and the attrition pattern just continues. So this, because then there is no more reproduction, the group size gets smaller and smaller. Um, that's, that's the usual, that's the usual thing that we see in, in, in these groups. What, what was the second part of the question? Uh, that was the whole question. Okay. Thank you. Then we have another question by Michael Taboski. Yes, sir. Uh, um, it's a question about the effects of group size. Uh, as far as I understood, you showed that uh, the breeders in large groups work less. So there is, there is apparently a, or seemingly a benefit uh, of group size for breeders, mm -hmm. uh, and. And that should have effects on productivity. Do you find such effects? Um, well, we find that there is that there is a, a small positive relationship between offspring production and group size in the wild population over the entire population. Mm. But this is it's, there's a lot of variation around that relationship, mm. and it's not terribly strong. And what we what in wild populations, what we really with these kind of correlative um, relationships, I think we need to be quite careful because what we would also expect is, or what we could imagine alternatively is that the large group is a consequence of, um, of good reproduction and not the cause of it. It might well be, and it might not be uncommon that it's the opposite way around. For example, a breeding pair can happen to be in a very good territory, gets a lot of food, has high reproductive success, and becomes a large group. And when we look at it, we see large group, high reproductive success. But the, the cause behind it could be habitat quality, or could be quality of the breeders, or um, just like um, stochastic variation early in, in breeding that sets them on the right trajectory. So there are quite a lot of alternative explanations um, that, that are possible and it, this relationship does not always or not necessarily mean that there is a causal relate, relationship between the helpers uh, presence and the reproductive success of the breeders. Yeah of course you're, you're definitely right about uh, the interpretation regarding correlative data but, but you have this uh, lab colony Mm -hmm. where you could do an experiment with uh, group size effects. I'm not sure whether you have done that or planned or whatever, but I think this would be a question to, to really um, answer by experimental approaches. Exactly right. And that's, that's what we are doing right now. <laughs> Thank you. Then before I ask my third question, I hand over to Lauren for his first one. Hello, Marcus. Uh, really fascinating talk. Thank you for uh, sharing that with us today. Um, I think I have a question that follows up on Michael's. And 
and apologize if I missed this already. So there's a lot of variation around reproductive success in the smaller groups. Mm -hmm. Have you looked at characteristics of those groups to compare the ones that are doing really well versus the ones that are doing very poorly? Is there anything that you can find that might help generate some predictions for an experimental study? Uh, we haven't we haven't investigated that uh, more deeply. Uh, what obviously we could be measuring like more environmental variables. We could um, we could be measuring food availability and density of food plants in their groups. I have some colleagues that that always that that remind me very often that that we don't have this data and that we should have this data yeah. uh, to explain some of these patterns. So um, yes, there the, there are things that we could do. But at the moment, we, we don't either don't have the data or haven't done the analysis to investigate what causes this variation in relatively small groups. And, and to follow up on that, I think Eduardo mentioned um, temporal nature of the interactions. Um, those data in that graph, they were across all years, right? Yeah. Could in, you, uh, I mean, could, I'm sorry, go ahead. You may, you're talking about the correlation between reproductive success and group size. Yes, yes. This continue to follow on Michael's um, theme. Um, I, I wonder if, you know, you talked about temporal seasonality mm. or temporal variation in rainfall in, the, in that environment. I wonder if there's something about really bad years, the small ones do really poorly, and then the, just it's a function of really good years. Very, and you might, with rainfall data, you can at least start to look at that, right? Yeah, very good point. Um, things that we can, we, we can look up and, and things that we can work on. But like what's really like, I think what, what is really important to understand is that morals can live 10 years or longer, even in the wild. They can live 15 years. This uh, closely related species in some labs mm. live in, in captivity up to 15 years. So by with this, although seven years is a long time to do a field study and yeah. a lot of work. We are still, I mean, we have essentially in our population just reached a point where we are beyond one generation. Of yeah. This so, blows my mind because I work with an animal that's gone after a year. Yeah. Right, right. <laughs> but like our breeders, we have breeders that continue breeding for four or five years. And before that, yeah. they've for two years and dispersed and been a single in between a year. Uh, so these are long lived animals. So although it sounds like, um, like, a lot and we have been working very hard and i think we have a lot of data yeah is still like only a certain extent and 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 like looking at environmental conditions that vary between years is what is an option but i think um gets gets much better when we have like a, a longer coverage of sure. reproduction in these animals yeah oh fascinating nonetheless thank you very cool then I have another question regarding one of the last stat statements you made in your talk that the Maryland bull rats are not obligate cooperative breeders because they can live for many years solitarily and then even pairs and breed as successful like cooperative groups. So I wanted to ask what is your definition for an obligate cooperative breeder? And I think there's one difference between the pairs in, the, in these small rats and pairs that say of um, um, foxes or, or some other canids is that when the pairs start reproducing, they always produce helpers, means cooperatively breeding um, groups. It's never that all the offspring disperse with reaching property and the next litter li leaves again. So after your definition, obligate cooperative breeders always have to start with a group. They're not allowed to start as a, as a pair. Well, obviously we're talking, I mean, very, very true. I, um, I can follow all your thoughts on this. These are good questions. I mean, we are talking about continuous variation um, between facultative cooperative breeders and, and obligate cooperative breeders. I'd say there's a continuum, but what, what, what would be the, the, the pure definition of an obligate cooperative breeder is a breeder, is a cooperative breeder where um, pairs usually fail to reproduce and have very low reproductive success. Obviously, that's not like, um, like it, there, is, there are probably no species where pairs always fail, but there will be species like meerkats and wild dogs that disperse in dispersal coalitions. And these coalitions are the main founders of new groups. And when individuals um, end up dispersing alone, 
they usually fail to reproduce and generate a group or yeah, fail to, to raise pups to, to adulthood. The other okay. thing that you, that you raised is a very good point. Mole rats only have that once in their life. That's the first litter and the second litter that they produce. When they produce the second litter, the first litter is probably so small that they can't help and are still, uh, are st still a burden. But once they are through this initial group founding stage, then very true, they will not, like facultative cooperative breeders, experience this situation again. Okay, yes, so there's probably very few obligate cooperative breeders. And I think at the beginning of your talk related to new social insects, I think in new social insects, they always start or typically start as a single female in the hymenopterans or as a pair in the termites, but I'm not sure I'm not an expert on this. So there, even though it goes to your sociality, the starting point is easier, more simple than the cooperative, obligate cooperative breeding, meerkats and wild dogs. Mm -hmm. if, 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 I, if I know that correctly. And we have a, another question by Eduardo. Only if we don't have anyone else who hasn't asked, right? Yeah. I'm going to follow on, on some of the latest comments eh, about, I think that some, some earlier comments made reference to variation. And that's something that caught my eye. The, the, for most graphs you showed, the data are, are all over the place. I mean, there, there, there are very few things where you had, I mean, probably the, the one with the effect sizes for the naked mole rats that went towards the end of the talk, one of the most, uh, conclusive ones. And I'm totally fine with that. I mean, you're just speaking how it's been seven years, but on the other hand, it's only one generation. So I'm sure that between collect, continuing to collect data and some of the experimental approaches, you're gonna be able to kind of control for some of the noise that's contributing to that huge variation. But, but one of the slides that caught my eye that if I remember well, you were showing us some data on the probability of survival, but I don't remember what it was that you were describing and I noticed that the probability of survival was double between the two groups that you were considering but you if I remember well you kind of still dismissed it as saying that they were not different and usually when we see a probability of survival that doubles or cuts in half no matter what it is it is substantial for, for anything that relates to the life of the animals can you help me remember what was it that you were describing to us that the probability of survival doubled uh, so it is, um, it is the, the, the probability of disappearance from the population, so either death or leaving, for different categories of individuals, either for non-breeding individuals in groups, for single individuals living, or for breeders that have a breeding position in the group. Okay. And the point is that... Because you're being, you're being so open about the variation and you're doing fantastic work, but I think it's great that you're, you're feeling like we're going to learn so much more in the next seven years. That is very likely. I mean, if, that, if you find that any of those two categories have half or double the probability of survival, that's a huge effect for anything that may have an adaptive value. Anytime we see survival increasing, doubling, that mm. can be huge. So with time, we'll see it, right? Which is what you're saying. You have to see the extent to which those patterns are confirmed over more years and more, more, more subjects. Absolutely. And I mean, uh, that's why I, I think I, I, I said there's no statistical difference in survival in those groups. And uh, there is, and what we see is that these animals can live very long. But it is true that um, that if we have like double the data, a difference that is one that is uh, of a magnitude of the factor 1.7 that I think it is in this case, that a, a probably a prob um, that the a larger data set will reveal or may reveal a, sig a significant statistical difference there. So absolutely. But, no, but, but that's my point. I don't care about the statistical significance. If you find two groups that double in survival, that is evolutionarily significant. That's why I'm saying that I, it would be a shame as you move forward, don't, don't close your, I would not discard that as a possible pattern that will hold with a profound evolutionary implication 
regardless of what your statistical significance is, which of course, if you have, because you still have little data, I would not go there. That, that's my point, that it's, the difference is huge. If you're talking double survival rates for well, one category over the other. There's another, I mean, biological thing uh, here. The single females, uh, they have, they, they can essentially um, disappear in this population from the state of being single female by two ways, either becoming a breeder and pairing up or um, by dying and disappearing. So there, I mean, there is more to this. And um, I, I agree that, I mean, I would expect, uh, and I can imagine that, that there is, that there may be a difference uh, if we had a, uh, on between these two groups, if we had a larger sample size. Thank you again, fascinating system. Yes, thank you very much to, to Markus Zertl again for a great talk. Thank you for everyone for contributing to a discussion. It was um, quite interesting. Um, I think, think for every, everyone here. With this, I'm going to, to stop the, the YouTube um, transfer because there are no more questions, but I still would like um, to point out again what we are going to have next week when Karen Kapheim is going to talk about causes and consequences of behavioral plasticity in bees. It will be also very interesting. 